All right, ClubWWI.com members. I'm standing by this week with a gentleman who, well, he's refereed everywhere from WWE to WCW to the New World Order. Uh, he's our favorite evil ref, and uh, as far as we're concerned, uh, he's always neutral. Guys, the one and only, Mr. Nick Patrick. Nick, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm, I, I have never been able to shake that evil ref reputation after all this time. No, that's, that's it. I, I always wondered that because I, I we had Danny Davis on here a while ago, and, uh, and he said, you know, no matter what he ever did, even when he was the neutral referee, people still booed him, uh, even when he, when he was just being a ref. Yeah, well, I, I, after a while, it kind of it wore off a little bit for me there towards the, my last couple of years that I was refereeing. But there was always somebody that would come up and ask me about the old NWO stuff that I did. No, oh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Well, Nick, before we even get into your career, why don't you uh, let uh, everybody know how things are by you and, and what's going on in the world of Nick Patrick right now? Well, right now I am the general manager, uh, manager and commissioner of Rampage Pro Wrestling. It's based out of uh, Warner Robins, Georgia. It's owned by Dr. Johnny Gayton, and I'm helping him run that wrestling company for him. And that's basically what I've been doing. We uh, we have a television show. It's on the Fox Channel out of Macon. It's uh, well, we got real good coverage all through Central Georgia right now. We're just trying to build a strong local base and make the company as strong as possible, and try and stretch out and see what we see how far we can run with it. No, absolutely. I find that that you know we talk to, to a lot of people out there about where there is to work, kind of in the United States. And everybody says, well, the territories are it's harder and harder to find work. But the more we talk to people, kind of in your position, it seems like it's sprouting up, and that there are a lot of uh, different areas that, that guys can work besides WWE or TNA. Yeah, well, there's, there are some different places starting to sprout up. Uh, unfortunately, right now, the smaller ones, you, you pretty much got to travel around to hit them all, and most of the smaller ones aren't up and strong enough for you to actually make the big money living that a lot of guys are wanting to try and make out of the wrestling industry. But, uh, but we're growing and trying. <laughs> we're going to be there eventually. No, absolutely. One of the things I think that a lot of people might not realize, and, and it's the kind of thing that unless you really looked into it, uh, you're actually the son of Jody Hamilton, the assassin. And, and yes. that, that surprises a lot of fans because I think typically people think of a second generation or a third generation guy and you would come in. Was there any talk about you coming in as the assassin junior or some sort of offset or, or were you always content with kind of being, uh, being your own character? Well, I wasn't so really concerned about being the assassin junior as, as like you said, as, as being my own character. When I first started, I started off as a referee and I always wanted to wrestle, but I was, you know, I wasn't really a big man. I was, you know, I'm only uh, six foot one and, and about the biggest I ever was was about 225, you know, so that's, you know, now I'm about 198, you know, so I you know, never was really a, really a, a big guy. So a uh, refereeing seemed to be really the best way for me to get in and really learn the industry and the business, and, and it gave me an insight uh, uh, that I would never have been able to get just by wrestling. So, and then eventually I, I became a referee, and I had real bad knee problems, I had several knee surgeries, and ended up going back to the referee and what I was really so comfortable with it and uh and I had good opportunities to get you know to land a couple of big referee jobs still so uh that's that was the route that I went a lot of fans don't even realize the you know the important role that a referee really does play in the match kind of in, in many ways almost directing you know the action they did do you find that a lot of people realize no, a lot of people don't realize that. And unless you get in there and are actually doing it, there's a lot of, of actual wrestlers that uh, that don't realize how valuable uh, an experienced referee is until they, they, you know, they get in there, especially for a young guy that's, that's still just learning our industry and what to do. Sometimes they can, you, know, you can you can get lost or intimidated by a crowd or whatever, and you're not sure quite what to do. And if you got somebody that's been in there and you know been down that road, they can kind of help get you. In, move it in the right direction, you know, kind of prod you and let you know what to do. Absolutely. I mean, because it's, it used to be in, in many ways kind of reading the crowd. And nowadays, especially in kind of a WWE environment, there's so much going on, I guess, in the people in the back and the eye in the sky that, you know, you not only have to work off the crowd, but it's kind of up to you to, to tell them how to work off the crowd. Yeah, and it's, 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 it's every crowd's different, too, so you have to learn how to feel each different place. You know, well, you can you can go and have a match in one town and, and just... And just have a five star tear down the building mats with people just, you know, swinging from the rafters and do the same thing somewhere in another town and they just look at you like, what was that? <laughs> you can't ever really tell. You just have to kind of go out and, and feel it, you know? No, yeah, absolutely. And it seems like, uh, 
especially with the timing nowadays too. I mean, there's so many times during during a match where it's kind of I guess up to you as the referee to to let them know, hey, you know, things are running low, things are are, are going long, and uh, and kind of stretching yeah. it out. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, too, the, the other thing that comes up with a lot of referees is that they don't get a chance to really ever play a character unless maybe they're under a mask or something like that. And you're one of the few who, who had a chance to play, as we said before, the evil referee gimmick, where, uh, you know, one of my favorite gimmicks ever was Danny Davis in the 80s. I, I loved him as the evil referee. And, and you had so many of those things kind of went with Nick Patrick when, when you were doing that in, uh, in WCW. Mm-hmm. Was there a lot of, I mean, watching Danny, did you take anything from, from stuff that he did, or was it a... No, I didn't really watch Danny a whole lot, to be honest with you. I watched some of his stuff back in the day, but I was so busy traveling on the road with a different company, I didn't really have time to, to pay a lot of attention to what the other folks were doing. Mm-hmm. Actually, we traveled so much, unless uh, somebody recorded what we did, we didn't get a chance to watch our own stuff. Yeah, it's before the days of the monitors in the back now, I guess, with, uh, with cable vision yeah, and stuff. Well, I mean, still, even with monitors in the back, you're seeing a raw product. You're not seeing a finished product that goes out on the air, you know, edited down, finished deal. You know, it gives you an idea of what's going on, and, you know, it gives you a feel, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't give you that final product. Yeah. But when you played the role, though, one of the things that kind of separated you from Danny, you did it at a time when, I mean, the business was blowing up, and you were a part of WCW at some of its highest points, and you were a big part of that, being with the NWO. That must have been great, kind of, to have the spotlight on you guys uh, higher than, I guess, it's been on anybody else. Yeah, it was, a lot, it, was, it was a lot of fun. You know, I always wanted to, I wanted to wrestle in the first place, and uh, it gave me an opportunity to get in there and, and do more than just do, you know, the traditional referee role. It got me a chance to go in there and, you know, show a little personality and show that I could do other things than just just be a referee. You know, it, it was it was a lot of fun. It was a fun time. Well, and you had the opportunity, uh, obviously, to wrestle Chris Jericho, which I think was one of the, the big one long before. He, yeah, I had a full match with Chris. Actually, I had the one big singles match where he had his uh, one hand tied behind the back that we mm-hmm. had in uh, WCW, and then when we went to uh, he had already gone to WWE, and uh, after Vest bought WWE, and I went up there. And I ended up being in a tag match with him. It was me and the Dudleys against Chris and The Rock and one of the referees up there named Mike Kyoto mm-hmm. in a six-man tag match. So I got to hook up with Chris a couple of times, actually. He was very good, very good at, uh, at what he does. One of the best in our industry. And he's got, and that's one of the things, too, I think, about Jericho. I mean, he, he spent so long kind of playing that comedy role. And nowadays, it completely switched his gimmick, and, and he's having success. Uh, you know, like crazy. I mean, he's one of those guys that can play, you know, comedy and serious and, and get over yeah, it. Yeah, he can go either way, any way he wants to go. That's good. That's the mark of somebody who's got a lot of talent, that they can not just be locked into doing something one particular way and, and always have to be that one particular thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's uh, kind of just switch it up a little bit. But I mean, when, with you being in the NWO, one of the things that I remember at the time watching happen and thinking to myself, actually during the show, this must be crazy, you refereed... Every match of the pay-per-view that had to sold out oh, the pay-per-view. That was the hardest pay-per-view I've ever done. That was like a three-hour pay-per-view, and I had to do every match. Oh, that was, uh, yeah, that was that one was tough. I guess that was uh, all they could come up with storyline-wise, but uh, I don't want to pull it off. That was crazy. I mean, I always thought to myself, like, was there ever any talk beforehand of, hey, why don't we have a, a junior and a referee that we can uh, yeah, plug? Yeah, really tone it down, though, so it wouldn't become like three hours of the Nick Patrick show, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I had to just really consciously make sure I toned myself down a little bit so it wouldn't, you know, just, I mean, that'd, that'd be a little bit hard to take three hours of anybody being shoved down your throat, especially a referee. Yeah, <laughs> seriously, all over the uh, each match that was out there. That, that pay-per-view, I remember, too, was kind of a big deal because that was, for a lot of fans, they didn't know really where the NWO was going. And, and seeing the pay-per-view like that, I think a lot of people were under the assumption that, you know, it was eventually just going to be renamed NWO and kind of be almost a brand of WCW. Mm-hmm. I mean, was, was there a lot of thoughts going into that? I mean, what, going into that pay-per-view, did you guys realize or, or was it kind of built up to the fact that that was the direction that you guys thought it was going to go? I'm not sure they knew what direction they wanted to go in, to be honest with you, because at that time they had started everybody that come in, they were drafting everybody into the NWO. And, you know, and I understand that they wanted to make it look like a gang, but they had, they overdid it. You know, they, they, all of a sudden everybody was either NWO or, or against the NWO, and there was no no, no no other personalities getting getting put over, you know what I mean? Like if you were a heel, you were in the NWO. And it, it kind of diluted it a little bit to me, in my opinion. It was hot when it had Hulk and, and X-Pac and Kevin and, and Scott doing their deal. 
you know, where we ended up adding, you know, there must have been a half a dozen or a dozen more guys that ended up, it was in the NWO before it was done. And, uh, it just, to me, it just diluted it a little bit. That was one of the reasons why I think it kind of started phasing out there. No, I, well, that's, I, I think a lot of fans don't even realize, you know, we didn't watch at that time that, and everyone remembers Hall and Hogan and Nash, but it, it really was such a small amount of time between the debut of the NWO, and I think it was this, by December of that year, it was when they had, you know, Hennig was in it, and Virgil, and, and Stevie Ray, and it, it just seemed like, and then once they kind of filled that up, they, they created a Latino world order, and, and it kind of seemed like they were just overbranding everything. Yeah, it just, yeah, well, sometimes when that, something catches on and it's hot, and Everybody tries to, they try to milk it for all it's worth and everybody tries to jump on the bandwagon. And there's, I saw NWO, BWO, LWO, I mean there's, there was every WO thing in the alphabet at one point in time. But that was just, uh, just, you know, that just tells you how hot it was at one time. I mean, I think, we, we just had Sonny Ono on last week for an interview and he had talked about even in Japan how big it got with the, with the NWO Japan and kind of the, this worldwide appeal that it had. Yeah. Well, it was hot. You know, that was one of the things that was, that was when, uh, WCW had taken over and started beating Vince in the ratings and, uh, and got him on the run a little bit there. You know, it was, it was a, that was a good period of time for WCW. I wish they could I wish they would have had the foresight and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, well, I'm not sure what I'm looking for, but stuff, whatever it took to kept that fire going instead of letting that fire peter out and, and then start declining again and then letting Vince slip in where he could uh, just come in and just buy the whole thing out. You know, by the end, it seemed like the people at, uh, at Turner and at Time Warner had, were, had uh, kind of got burnt out on the wrestling product and was really ready to unload the whole company, you know. Oh, yeah. And, you know, because they saw how good it could be. They saw what it was. And they saw how good it could be. And then they saw what it was starting to turn back into again. And, and I said, well, let's just dump this thing before we, you know, before it hits the bottom. Yeah, I mean, it was, it, and it's funny, because a lot of people, they, they think back to that time period, and they think of, you know, Eric Bischoff, Hulk Hogan, and obviously they draw comparisons to today's TNA. I don't, have you, have you had a chance to watch any of the, the TNA since Hogan and uh, Eric have been back? Yeah, I've watched a little bit of it. Uh, my oldest son uh, is uh, autistic, and he loves to watch wrestling, and he makes me get every pay-per-view. <laughs> uh, I don't sit and watch every one of them all the way through with him, but he is, you know, like cover to cover all over it, you know. So I have seen some of the stuff that they've done. I mean, it's a lot of, uh, I, mean, I mean, obviously people draw the comparisons to the time that you were there. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on, on what you have seen and kind of, I know they're obviously going a little bit more with uh, the Hogan-heavy kind of NWO-ish direction. Uh, I mean, do you have any thoughts on it? No, I, I kind of like the, the way they're going. They're going to have to be careful because they're trying to interject so many new people. And it's not that they're new people. It's people that they're seen and are, have been over with another company. But that doesn't mean that they're necessarily over and involved in something right now. That means that they're, that they're just a new face of the new territory just because they happen to work for WWE at one time doesn't necessarily mean that just because suddenly now they're on the roster that they're going to be selling out venues everywhere they go. You know, it's going to take time to get guys involved in storylines and involved with, you know, with whatever character they're going to be because a lot of guys have to develop whole new personas, names, and characters because they had to leave their stuff with Vince because of the trademark. But, uh, <clears throat> I, I kind of like where it's going because I think TNA had got to a point where they needed to be shaken up a little bit. Mm-hmm. They had a good core group of guys, but that same core group of guys had been working with each other, and it was starting to get into, you know, like, okay, what new can we do with, you know, for the same group of guys? You know, so I think it, it's good to have a, a whole new mix of guys that, that's been sitting dormant for a little while, too, because there's been, facing, there's been a lot of talent out there that, uh, that was just sitting dormant, and uh, it's given them an opportunity to uh, to come up and shine for for whatever reason they didn't get that 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 push up and uh, up for Vince. And hopefully, some of those kids will get that push with TNA because a lot of those kids deserve a push. They just for one reason or another never got it up there. Whether they they just didn't fit in personality wise or. They didn't kiss the right rear end or whatever. I don't know. You know yeah. I, I'm glad to see some of those kids uh, get an opportunity. Orlando Jordan and, and uh, Mr. Anderson now, I guess, would be uh, what we uh, would have to call uh, him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, those are some kids that uh, had great potential. 
Um, well, I, you know, it, it, it's funny because I've talked to Orlando Jordan actually hosts an audio uh, on our site. He hosts a Club OJ. And for so long, uh, he just wasn't doing anything in terms of, you know, any of the major stuff. He was out of WWE, no, no shot in TNA. And seeing him on that show, I told him, I said, it, it kind of came off so fresh because, you know, you haven't been jammed down everybody's throats. You haven't been back for all these different returns. And it was kind of like, you know, it took something like this to make people remember that you were still out there and available. You know, so they, in many ways, that's kind of what we're getting out of this. Yeah. Well, that little sitting time for a while, you know, it's tough. It's out of sight, out of mind in our industry. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to have to come back in and get reestablished. But people do remember a couple of those guys because they did get a little bit of a push up there. You know, for whatever reason, it got snuffed out for a lot of them, you know. Yeah. You know, because they have their own reasons, you know. You, you never know for sure what what the real reason is sometimes. But, uh, well, it's, it's going to be a good thing for them. I think, but it's going to take, they're going to have to have a little bit of time for storylines and characters and all that stuff to develop. Yeah. For, uh, for you know, for I think they start really seeing a return at the, at the gate business-wise. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's all about just uh, you know, kind of bringing in, you know, bringing in new faces, but obviously using the new faces correctly. Uh, and that's, I mean, you were a big part of uh, one of the storylines. Everybody kind of talks about the Alliance storyline with WWE and, uh, uh, and WCW. Uh, what were your thoughts on that? Because one of the things that a lot of people still bring up is the fact that it was kind of tough because it was a storyline of WWF battling their competitor, but it was done on kind of their home turf. I mean, did you ever kind of feel like, uh, how did you feel about it? Well, I, I, I was always skeptical of it because <clears throat> when we were at war, it was two distinctly different companies owned by two different people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, how, can you, how can you have a war with yourself? You know what I mean? Even though they bought us and they wanted to look like Raw and SmackDown was fighting each other and blah, blah, blah. You know, it didn't, they knew that it was a McMahon product. He bought it and owned it, so... It's really hard to buy into it that it, that it to me that it, that we, that Raw was warring with SmackDown or with ECW or whatever. It just it, it just didn't it just wasn't something that I really bought into so much at the time. And uh, I don't think it did the business for him that he was thinking that it would do. It was I, I think kind of maybe he may have underestimated that there still were WCW fans out there. I think even a lot of people would just automatically boo them. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the, the company survived as long as it did. And, and a lot of people, almost fans, kind of took it personally, the way, uh, the way some of the WCW well, did. I, I didn't realize that there was such a line drawn between the two companies. I, I always was kind of under the impression that uh, there was fans, that there was some that leaned toward one or the other, but pretty much most fans kind of liked both and was monitoring both. But, <coughs> excuse me, when I went up there, I found out that there were hardcore WCW fans and there were hardcore WWE fans because when we went up there, it didn't matter if you was a referee, a heel, a babyface, a manager, whatever you were. If you came from WCW, the WWE people hated your guts when we first went up there. And it didn't make a dang who you was. Sting was our top babyface guy. He could have went up there in a WWE crowd and then booed him out of the building. You know, which you can turn that to your advantage if you know how, you know, which exactly. a lot of us did. But uh, I never realized that there were people that were that hardcore drawing the battle lines, you know, as far as fans go. Well, it's almost like a, at a certain point it kind of felt like the Monday Night Wars almost got personal to a point where, you know, fans were kind of told that, you know, you're on this side, you're on that side. They got really kind of... Uh, it, it, for, for a brief period of time, it was hard not to get emotionally invested and kind of pick a side, at least in your mind. Yeah, well, they they were put in a position with us running right up against each other, time slot wise, where they did have to have to pick. You know, it was back before TiVo and all that. You know, oh yeah, before the other show, but you know, back then we didn't have TiVo and all that stuff, so the fans pretty much had to pick pick their poison, which one they wanted, which one they liked the best. It's funny too because uh, they even bring that up because everyone was talking about when when TNA and WWE went head to head. They said, "Oh, you're gonna have people flipping back and forth." I said, "Who flips back and forth anymore? If you do that, you kind of screw yeah. up the TiVo." Exactly. You just record it and go. Uh, obviously, one of the other things I want to ask you about a match that I'm sure you're asked about a lot. Uh, something I was just looking at on YouTube. Uh, obviously, Sting and Hogan at um, Starcade '97, the match with Bret Hart. That to this day, you know, almost wrestling folklore to a lot of people. Uh, Hogan. Uh, was supposed to kind of get a fast count over Sting. Bret Hart was playing the gimmick where he just hated referees. He was just coming off of WWE. Uh, and then the three count, 
that I guess was supposed to be a fast count that kind of looked like a, a regular count. Uh, and I, I figured we have you on. We'll ask you about uh, about just that whole uh, that whole situation. To be honest with you, I did so many daggum matches with those guys. I don't remember what the situation was with that. I remember no conflict come out of it. But mm-hmm. I, I remember that. Uh, what did I do? A fast count and Sting on that? Or it something? was. Yeah, Hogan had him down uh, after a leg drop, and it was supposed to be a fast count where Sting would kick out at the last second, and Bret Hart was going to come in, and it was like he was his debut. I believe what had happened is I was getting conflicting stories from what actually they wanted wanted me to do. I had one faction telling me they wanted one thing from me, had another faction telling me they wanted another thing from me, so I kind of split it down the middle. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm, I remember exactly the scenario, so that's that's what happened out of that that deal. How tough was that to work under that, those kind of situations? Because I mean, there was, it seemed like every other week there was a power play, just like in TNA yeah, has to. Yeah, because you never knew who was going to be the boss. You just kind of had to ride the fence and not piss anybody off because you never knew that person that you, you know, that person that was doing something dumb that was irritating you. You might have read them out about it and never know if they might be your boss next week. Yeah, you know. And, and so it was. Uh, you had to bite your tongue a lot during that period of time, and it was it was kind of tough because there was a lot of different people that WCW put in place. I think you just have to reach and just scratch your head and go, "What in the world are they thinking?" You know, was, you know some of the different people that they put in charge as presidents of the company that never had ever even I don't even think they even watched wrestling on TV. Some of them, yeah. You know, now they're trying to run our dang show and tell us about characters and story. They may have known how to sell the product. But they didn't know how to create the product or present the product. Uh, so yeah. they, it was it was a frustrating time. There was a lot of good, but there was a lot of a lot of frustration too. It was like it was like having a hot rod out in your in your driveway that you know that thing's going to go out there and run 180 miles an hour, but for dang for the life of you, you can't get the damn thing to crank, and you don't know why. You know, yeah. it, was, it was frustrating, you know. You bring in ten different mechanics, right, to, uh, to all argue with each other, right? Yeah, they all stand there and argue with each other about what the problem is, you know. <laughs> and it's probably just one little wire that needs fixed. <laughs> and, uh, anyway. Well, is that the advantage that, that Vince has? I always said that, that one of the reasons why Vince always kind of comes out on top of these guys is because at the end of the day, you know, Bob Carter uh, isn't ahead of creative. You know, Ted Turner wasn't ahead of creative. At the end of the day, it's kind of like it all goes back to Vince, and, and you're less likely to have kind of revolving leaders. Yeah, you know it's funny that you asked me a question about that count because I had forgotten all about that for years. That I mean that went way back, and now I remember exactly the scenario because it was so funny because I had one group tell me another thing, one thing that they wanted me to do, and then I was all ready to go. I didn't, you know, I wasn't playing any politics. I didn't care back then. I knew I was pretty good at what I did, and they liked keeping me in, in the top slot because of that reason. And then I had another group of people come up and tell me something different, and then I was like, okay. Now I am stuck in the middle. <laughs> yeah. So evidently, I did. I did uh, put it right down the middle. It could have went either way. <laughs> I did cover my butt, I guess. <laughs> you said you couldn't tell if it was fast or not. So <laughs> it's it's so funny because this is something that you know. Obviously, a month after WWF had the same situation, it kind of seemed like every there was political hotbeds all over the place, and in the middle were always the referees. Yeah, well, because there was one person from each faction that was that either was going to be in charge or was that was in charge or was about to be in charge, and they were on opposite sides of that equation. You know, like okay, uh, somebody's going to get mad, so let's just try and split the difference here. <laughs> Do you end up pleasing the right people in the end, or uh... Uh, not really? <laughs> but they realized that the position that I was put in, mm-hmm. and they didn't uh, let the old stuff roll downhill thing on me, you know what I mean? Yeah. They, uh, they, they realized that the other group wanted one thing, and you know, both sides knew what happened. You know, so one says, how come you didn't get counter faster? And I said, because that person over there told me not to, and y'all settle it, you know what I mean? Pass them around. <laughs> exactly. No, if you're being told to do it, you might as well uh, point out who's doing it. Yeah. Oh man, it's uh, it's just a funny deal with with, with WCW. The fact that as we we're talking before, '97 was the, the top year, and then just a few years later, things started going. You know, until eventually they got bought out. Was there ever a point when you were with the company that you kind of looked around and you said, "Well, I, I guess that's it. I guess we're 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 heading uh, back down the, the ladder now." Oh yeah, it was a lot of times, a lot of times. Did anyone stand out to you, or was uh, as a, a moment that you remember? Does it, anything stand out to me? No, not particularly. I just, uh, 
I remember when the ratings started slipping and Vince started climbing again. And then all of a sudden they started doing silly, desperate stuff. And what, what got to me was there was a period in time where instead of coming up with cool, new, creative stuff, they were just doing slams on each other. And it started, I think, from the WCW camp. They would just do to try to copy what Vince did or, or just make fun of what Vince did. You know, with different skits and different scenarios and stuff. And I'm like, man, why don't you spend half as much time coming up with something new and exciting and creative and a new character as much as you're wasting time trying to poke fun and, and actually just advertise the other people. You know, yeah. when you're making fun of them and talking about them, the people are going to think, well, hey, maybe I should check them out and see what they're talking about. You know, it's, it's free publicity for them, you know. Yeah. I, I, I disagreed with all that crap. And, and both sides for a while was doing it. And that, uh, I just thought that was silly and I didn't really see a point to it. And it, it kind of irritated me because there was a lot of people there wanting, wanting to get different breaks and do different things. They wonder, well, how come I can't get a storyline or I can't, well, we're wasting a lot of time trying to make fun of something that Vince did last week, you know. Just, yeah. To me, it was a waste of time and a waste of money. And in the end, they ended up, uh, it ended up being one of the things people point to as a swinging point when, when Shivani told everybody to go watch Raw and watch Mick Foley win the, uh, win the world title. Yeah, people who might otherwise not have even known that something big was going to happen <laughs> was, was going to yeah, happen. Uh, yeah, some people thought. Well, so I'm sure that that in their mind they thought that they was going to ruin ruin it for them. But other people thought, well, damn, that might be cool. You know? Yeah, it's a double edged sword. There, it's just. Uh, <clears throat> it was frustrating to see that they had things caught on fire and, and to see that they were letting them you know, peter out because of ego or whatever and. You know, and all the private jets and private uh, buses and private locker rooms and private this and that for different stars instead of ever instead of the old traditional the, the heel locker room, baby face locker room, everybody dressing together and being like being like a team. And that's when it quit being a, being a team, and it all become about me and everybody just wanting to 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 rape it for as much money as they could get out of it and. And that milk all the injury time they could out of it. You know, it became no longer fun. It became a business. You know, that yeah. everybody was trying to to get the most out of what they could out of it instead of you know instead of that gung ho attitude like everybody has when they're first trying to get started and breaking into the industry. Yeah, you know, lose that whole uh, that whole killer instinct and the eye of the tiger or whatever uh, whatever yeah. you had to begin with. It's become about. Uh, just, just take the money, you know. The, the pride was pretty much gone. Man, that's gotta be. I mean, for you, for you too. You grew up, obviously, you know, with your, with your dad being the assassin. I mean, you probably saw a lot of people who came in and out of. You know, I mean, WCW obviously it was a different company than NWA in the territory, but almost an extension of it. I mean, I don't know if people realize just the, the amount of history that kind of got closed down with uh, with WCW. Yeah, well, it. it, it my dad was in, in the position where, and, and, it's, and me too, where I got to work with guys from my dad's generation, and you know, and then through that transition, I, I, the, the good period of time for me also was when I got to work for Georgia Championship Wrestling right before WWE and all that, back when there were still territories. I was like one of the lucky guys that, that that got to work for a couple of years when there actually was still like seven or eight territories around the country that you could go to. Yeah, you know, they were all starting to peter out, and Vince was starting to gobble them all up. And you know, when I first started, there was a Central States and and Tampa and Charlotte and Georgia and, and Louisiana and, and a couple of them in Texas and one in California, and one in Portland, and, and of course New York and Canada. And, and I mean, there was places to go. You know, yeah. and, uh, that, that was that was really a fun time in the business too. I was uh, I was one of the fortunate guys, and guys like me and. And, and hitting and, and you know from that age group era that are second generation guys that uh, they got a chance to just to have fun and do the territory thing and it was a different mentality and a different business then uh, when you you know territories and then uh, this whole national international conglomerate thing that they got going now yeah so I agree with you I remember uh, I mean I was up here in New York but we would get. USWA and World Class would be on ESPN. We get GWF. We get some of these you know, different shows that would come in, and there was nothing cooler than kind of seeing somebody you knew from, say, Memphis, and all of a sudden you tune into World Class, and there's that same person, and, and you kind of watch them being used by a completely different creative set of eyes, kind of wh- where to put them, and, and good guy, bad guy. Uh, it was a different, it was a different product altogether. Yeah, well, that was a good time, good time, good era, good way to learn the industry too. No, now it's uh, 
it's a whole different learning process and a whole different whole different animal. Well, now you're getting a chance, as you said before, about uh, Rampage Pro Wrestling, where you're working as general manager. Obviously, you're getting a chance probably to work with a lot of young guys and uh, and kind of help them along as well. Uh, yeah, we've got some young guys, and we've got uh, the best of all the local independent guys within the southeast area that's around here. we got guys coming in from Carolinas and Mississippi. A lot of them are from around the Atlanta area, because the Atlanta area has always been a, a hotbed for wrestling. There's a lot of wrestlers, a lot of, a lot of big names, a lot of independent guys. It's a good area. No, you won't. But, uh, yeah, we do have a bunch of young guys, and it is fun to help help mold their careers a little bit and see get give them some direction and let them, uh, you know, develop some character and stuff. It's got to be good, too, because, I mean, obviously you were a part of uh, when WWE had Deep South, I guess, doing developmental. With them, you, you were there uh, doing some of the training. What was that yeah, one? That was a lot of fun, too. I was helping my dad write the shows down there, come up with different ideas for characters and stuff, and, you know, the kids would come up with characters that they wanted to try up there. And, you know, that was, Deep South was, was a fun time. It was yeah. a good time. I wish it could have lasted. Well, you know, we had uh, we interviewed uh, Bill DeMont. I mean, he had nothing but great things to say about just, I mean, the opportunity that I think a lot of these young guys get to work uh, under somebody like, you know, your dad, you, Bill, uh, and kind of learn the business directly almost uh, as part of WWE's farm league. It must have been great for them as well. Yeah, to give them a little chance to to find out what to expect when they got up there, too. I mean, it's different to just train and work independence and all of a sudden... You're thrown into that atmosphere. It's different. You know, you don't know what to think or what to expect or what, what's expected of you. And, uh, you know, at least those kids had an idea. Of, you know, when they come walking through the door, it wasn't, there were no surprises. You know, they knew what to expect and, and what was going, what was expected of them. So, to where a lot of other kids, when we come to different towns, you know, there's a lot of kids that show up, different people are training them, you know, that, that weren't trained through the, the WWE system. They don't know what they don't know what to expect or what they're looking for. You can just kind of see some of them. They come in there and they get a tryout. They say, "All right, kid, get in the ring. Who'd you look at? Like they look like a deer in the headlights. <laughs> oh man, this kid is just scared to death. He ain't gonna be able to show them nothing." So uh, those kids had a good advantage because uh, they had good teachers. And like I said, when they got there, they knew what was going to happen, and there was no surprises for them. No, absolutely. I think a lot of the guys today, it's uh, it's funny, by the time you get to WWE, there used to be a time where you, you struggle, you struggle, you struggle, and now it's almost like you get trained to kind of come in and, uh, and, and do the product on TV, which is you know, kind of different than, I guess, what you guys are doing. Everyone talks about the WWE style, so I mean, it's almost like a different kind of training almost that goes into uh, WWE developmental. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's completely different. You have to learn... Uh, different styles that you have to learn how to do interviews, you know, which you had to know how to do that in the day, but they do different interviews, different style in WWE than, than they used to back in the day. Even when you'd watch old Georgia Championship Wrestling interviews, guys would be looking right at the camera and talking and cutting an interview like they was yelling at you at home. Mm-hmm. You know, on WWE guys are, it's like the camera's not there sometimes, you know. There's a lot of different, different type things and, and the work wrestling style itself is different. And yeah, so, yeah. It's best to, to go if you're going to go to WWE. You want to at least go and check one of their camps out and, and see what the style is all, what it's like, what it's all about. Absolutely. Well, Nick, last question I want to ask you. We ask all of our guests the same question. Uh, if you could choose anybody, maybe somebody that you grew up watching before you broke into the business, maybe somebody who you just haven't been in the same company with, they say, "I wish I could have worked with this person." Who would you pick? Wish I could have worked with this person. Yeah, either in their prime, maybe somebody in a different time period. Wow, because I've worked with about five generations of guys. <laughs> I pretty much have worked with pretty much with everybody, but I would think it would have to be an old timer because who knows what's who's coming up in the future. So it would have to be somebody like that would like it was really famous or somebody like. Maybe Gorgeous George, maybe, because he was like such a showman, one of the first original showmen yeah. back in the day when when wrestling was was more ground and pound type of thing, and and everybody was trying to really make believers out of all the fans that you know, were killing each other, and he had the flamboyant, you know, a gimmick, you know, what yeah. I mean? and all these guys are beating the crap out of each other trying to, you know. They believe it. Here's a guy that's throwing rose petals and is <laughs> like the top guy, you know. To me, I would like to have met 
somebody like that and work with him. I thought that I think that'd been pretty cool. Absolutely. It's been decades before his time by a mile. Uh, Nick, uh, before I let you go, we give all of our guests a chance to talk to their fans. So what do you have to say to all the Nick Patrick fans out there? Thanks for supporting me all the years, and uh, I'm still around. Just because I hadn't been in the in the main thrust for the last little bit, I had back surgery, and uh, I have to be careful, selective with what I do. You know, I can. There's certain bumps, things I just can't do anymore. So I'm really trying to hang out in the business end of it. So uh, I'm still around. Check out Rampage Pro Wrestling, and you can see what I'm doing now. Excellent. Thanks, Nick. It's been great talking to you. All right, man. Have a good day.